Um, hello, everyone, and welcome um, to the, today's webinar. Um, I'm Karen Fisher. I'm a senior writer with the Chronicle of Higher Education, and uh, I want to welcome everyone to today's virtual event. We're going to explore a crucial topic, preparing students for jobs of the future. Um, as the World Economic Forum has, um, has suggested or estimated, um, some 40% of core skills required in jobs will change over just the next five years. And that kind of uh, enormous churn presents a real challenge for colleges. On one hand, we know that students and their families um, come to college with the thought that they want to get a good career um, at the end, as well as their degree. Yet, um, how do you predict when there's such so much flux? And how do you keep readying students to have the, the skills to help them successfully make the transition from college to career? And that's what we're going to address today. Um, I've got a great panel with me, and uh, I hope that we will be um, getting many great questions from you in the audience as well. Um, before I get started, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so please send your questions, um, your comments, your feedback um, in the Q&A box in the chat. Um, for security reasons, we will um, vet them. So if you don't see it pop up right away, it's just that um, that you know we're reading them so please have patience and you know as i said um, we want this to reflect um, your queries your interests your feedback and so um, please put them in the box and in the second half of the panel i will be getting um, to those questions that you submit um, also just a reminder that this panel is being recorded and we will be sending an email with a link to that recording um, within the next couple of days to everybody who signed up for today's session. Um, I wanna take a moment to thank the underwriter of today's broadcast, Wiley Educational Services. Uh, we appreciate their support um, for this panel and for helping to bring this um, conversation to our audience. Um, just to let you know, um, at about the halfway point of today's session, um, Liz McMillan, um, a Chronicle editor, will do a brief Q&A with Todd Zipper, who's Executive Vice President for University Services and Talent Development with Wiley. Um, and then he, they will talk for a few minutes and then we'll return to our panel. So it will be in two parts, just so we don't lose any of you. Um, so with the housekeeping out of the way, let me get to the introductions. Um, I'm joined today by four speakers who bring really important perspectives and experience um, to this question. Um, so first, uh, let me introduce Mark Austin, uh, who's incoming Dean and Associate Provost at Augusta University Online. Next, Gary Boyer, Senior Director of Career and Professional Success at Butler University. Iris Palmer, Deputy Director at New America Foundation. And Jack Seuss, Vice President of Information Technology and CIO at Baltimore, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, so before I stumble over my words too much, let's let's get to the panelists. Um, so let me just start with a very big, broad question. Um, you know, as I said at the outset, students do come to college um, with careers in mind, you know, they say in surveys that getting a good job is quite important to them and, and a reason why they, they come to college. Yet we know that the transition to work isn't easy. Um, and I don't want to be um, be overly simplistic. I know there's many, many reasons for this, but I want to turn to each of you and just ask you to weigh in on what you what you think are one of, or two perhaps of the most important barriers that um, can impede students from making a successful transition to their careers. And Iris, why don't I start with you? Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so a couple of things we hear from students that we've talked to in focus groups, one-on-one -on -one in-depth interviews. Um, one is knowing how to present their learning uh, and knowledge to employers when it's not necessarily an applied uh, course of study that they're in. So and getting any kind of guidance about how to communicate with employers about what they've learned in their um, education in a way that um, can also contribute to my second piece that we hear a lot of, which is understanding even if they are in implied fields, um, that some of these communication, teamwork, and interaction with authority skills, what people call soft skills or 21st century, whatever we call them, um, are incredibly important. And being able to communicate that to an employer in any kind of interaction, that they both have those skills and have learned those in, through their education. So those are two that we hear over and over again. 
from students and actually also from the, our employers that we that we've spoken to. Great, and I, I want to I do want to circle back to that question of, of how you how you articulate it. I mean, how you most translate college to career in in a few minutes. But um, but Gary, why don't I turn to you and ask you the same question about what in your work you see as some of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks. Sure. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I, I would I would echo what Ira said. I definitely hear those things from students and see those things um, from students. But a couple of other things that we notice here um, is a sort of a lack of ability to make a decision, to make a final decision and be able to live with that. What, what we see sometimes with our students is that they're, I don't know if it's a lack of experience and being able to make a decision for themselves, but really being afraid to make afraid to make a move because they're fear fearful that it's not going to work out or they're making the wrong move. Um, and so we really we, we try to work with students on making a good decision, weighing options in, in all the things that they do. Um, the other thing that I would say um, that I see as a barrier to some of the students um, being a success is um, less than 50% of Butler students have worked in the world of work before they come to school. Um, many of them have done volunteerism, they are active in sports, they're doing other things with their church, other types of activities, but there's a lack of understanding of the world of work. And unless they're doing one, two, or three internships, it's difficult for them to be able to see themselves in the work, in the work environment and understand um, how, how the world of work um, is really, how, how it works. Um, and so I think those are two barriers that I really see that, uh, um, are, that hinder our students. Um, yeah, I, I think I think we don't we don't always uh, properly appreciate just the the change in the, the you know the the lack of work experience that many traditionally aged students um, are not you know they're not they're not coming with that experience. Um, Mark, what about you? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of students that I talk to about this question about how do I get prepared for work and how can I use my university experience to prepare us. It, their, their number one question is, is you know, Mark, how, how do we get an edge, right? How do we, because it's a very competitive job environment. So what is it that it's going to take to help us differentiate ourselves in, a, in an environment where it's very competitive and they know that they need to develop skills that they fundamentally have never applied before. So how, how do they get the edge? Um, I think one of the biggest barriers that they face to getting that edge and finding a meaningful employment for themselves is information. So as administrators, we have tons of information about job markets, about labor markets. And when we make good informed decisions about which programs to launch or which degrees to build or micro credentials to create, we're looking at a labor market. We're trying to understand what's the, the match between a course and a program and, you know, and the labor market. And those students don't have the same level of information, especially first gen. So I think one of the biggest um, you know, areas of focus for us as administrators and, and university officials is to provide students with better decision making frameworks, which includes information about the labor market. So how do I make a choice between major A and B? Um, and what implication does that have for me when I make a job when I'm looking for a job? So it's it's drawing that connection between college and career which in my mind is a function of, uh, of labor market information in many respects, you know, it's sort of technical, but how do you build that connection? And I think, especially for the first gen and some disadvantaged communities, getting that connection, especially when they don't have a network, a personal network uh, is really important. And then Jack, last but not least, let me, let me turn to you and, and, and ask what you've been seeing. Well, you know, what's interesting is, is that most of the students that I work with are students in technical majors. And so they've always had this problem that, frankly, what they're learning in the classroom is going to be not that useful, maybe even by the time they've left the classroom um, and gone into workforce or certainly within two or three years. And so they've been facing this problem that um, I explained to them, they have to explain how they're able to learn on their own. And they have to be able to give demonstrations of how they've gone out and been able to acquire new skills when they've needed it to do projects, work, et cetera, that they weren't necessarily taught in the classroom. Because all employers, at least in the tech sector, are looking for people that are going to be able to personally grow over time with the jobs that are going to be there. 
The other two things that I sort of highlight to all of the tech students that I see coming through are the fact that um, they need to learn how to communicate, especially to non-technical people, that um, often there is a way of talking about things that you have to be able to explain it. And to explain it, you often have to be able to boil it down in a way that everyone could understand this. And so learning how to do those kinds of skills really sets students up for success. But that's where teaching them that, yes, these courses where you have to learn how to write, these courses where you have to learn how to present are so fundamental to your long-term success. That's why we're trying to emphasize these. And the last thing, I, I just want to highlight what Ira said around soft skills, that you know we see that the difference among students one, two, three years out is these soft skills that they're able to acquire. If they're able to get these and have tech skills, they can do almost anything at companies. Jack, Iris, both of you made the point that, that in some ways it's it's about how how do you make that, how do you show what what you you what you've gained in in the classroom, and then how do you show how it's going to be relevant um, in the workplace? And so I, I want to ask each of you. I mean, do you, are there things that have helped? Um, do you think um, in terms of strategies in um, in helping students uh, make employers or help employers understand the ways that what they have learned um, is and can be in an ongoing sense relevant to what they are going to do um, if they are hired. Um, Jack, I mean, do, what do you say to your students when, when you're giving them that advice? No, it's it's a it's a great question, and, and frankly, one of the projects that I'm spending a huge amount of time on is a project here where we're starting to implement something called the Comprehensive Learner Record. And, and the whole idea of the Comprehensive Learner Record is to be trying to bring in um, what your learning outcomes are in key areas, as well as all these co-curricular, experiential, service learning, because those elements really are defining sort of your personalized education experience but they're also a huge part of who you are and what you bring to the workforce. And so learning how you can talk about those kinds of skills is absolutely essential. And I don't think that um, historically we've done a good job in just relying upon the transcript to be able to do that. And so that's one of my areas that I'm focusing a lot on. But in the short term, while we're building that, what we're really trying to get students to be doing is unpacking and talking more about themselves as the whole person and being able to be more on their feet adaptable to questions that come up because many of them have had experiences they're just trying to think of courses that they had and often they've had experiences outside of the classroom that are very relevant to this and and learning how to interview is an art I think the interview piece is huge. Just being able to have examples in your back pocket that show how you've dealt with those situations and being able to bring that out in an interview because Jack's on the bleeding edge of trying to help people show through portfolios and other ways that um, people have these skills, but employers are behind in using those um, pieces, I think, in many different fields, maybe not as much in tech, but in other fields, they certainly are. Um, another thing we've seen is um, just integrating project-based learning with employers that may hire your graduates um, during your entire um, education. And if you can do that, then they're demonstrating those skills over and over again. And your students also have a ready-made example that they can pull forward and say, here's how I actually worked with an employer. And it's not even like obviously internships and all of that are very important, but actually integrating it into the curriculum can be a really interesting way to give um, students a uh, way to express this to employers. Sorry, <laughs> I have to unmute myself before I'm so anxious to ask you a follow up on that question, Iris. I mean, do you, do you, do you see, are there effective ways? I mean, I, I think there, there historically has been some hesitance about among faculty in, you know, seeing kind of career development, career preparation as being their their job. Um, are there ways in which you have seen um, those, those, this sort of gets if effectively integrated into the class? 
I, I, I would actually, tur- yeah, I was going to turn that over actually to somebody who's on the ground more than I am. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, I saw you nodding, Mark. So. In a similar vein, we're, we're doing a, 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 we're building a project. This is at George Mason um, in the middle of a transition to Augusta. At George Mason, we're building a skills transcript. It's a little bit like a comprehensive learner record. And the nice thing about this skills transcript is we're basically mapping skills against courses. So it's a big project and it is, it is very complex, but um, the data has grown. Uh, resources like MC Burning Glass and others are now providing a sense of the skills that are associated to jobs and also to majors. And so that effort uh, is very helpful to faculty. Instead of writing a learning objective, although they do that as well, they can see how those learning objectives relate to concrete skills that are changing in the workplace. And because those skills change, it's not always evident to faculty that they're conveying an enormous number of skills that are highly valuable. So that's sort of step one is, again, use these, these uh, data resources that we have. But even better than that is to work with employers to understand what are those skills that they're looking for. Jack and I are working on a project actually within the greater Washington region to better understand what those employer sought skills are, those in-demand skills, and line them up to the curriculum that we're building, um, creating uh, essentially digital credentials that help a student see what they're learning from a course in terms of skills as reflected by employers. And that's also helpful for faculty as well. They don't necessarily see what the employers see uh, when employers are making hiring decisions. So getting that transparency is, is really the key. And maybe I can ask you both about you and both you and Jack about this as you're doing this work. But when you're talking to employers, um, are are you seeing sort of disconnects between um, what they want and, and what you're teaching, or is it just a matter of just of kind of understanding how to articulate that you're doing already what they want, and that you just have to, as you say, make it more transparent. It's, it's, it's tough um, for sure, but it, it does take, uh, it, it takes time, but I think it's a productive exercise to say, what are the skills that you're looking for? And in this context, an association of employers gets together uh, in the Greater Washington Partnership to provide that visibility um, for universities like ours to understand what they're looking for. And what we are seeing is that many of the skills, especially in technical areas, are being taught in classes. They're just not directly lined up to what an individual student would need to describe as a skill that they're obtaining uh, in a course as it lines up to a job. And so making that clear is, I think, really the focus of our work. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And, and I think if there is a complaint that I would say about employers is they're too specific with their current needs today not necessarily thinking about their needs three and five years out. And because uh, your point is well taken at the start of this, that many of the skills they're going to need in their future employees, they don't even know yet they need um, because they haven't been quite invented. Who knew five years ago we would have the explosion that we've had necessarily in data science and machine learning and these sorts of elements, or um, that the pandemic would hit and change the way work is done. And that requires a new set of emotional, social skills that we need from employees. So I, I think that as we move forward, employers sometimes can get too specific and that can be potentially, um, we have to remain ready to push back when they're trying to be too specific on certain things um, to recognize that no, we have to be staying at the right level for the skills that we're teaching. Gary, I wanna bring you in and yeah, <laughs> and ask you how, how you've been thinking about that. Sure, I, I mean, I, I would say that um, you know, trying to get what, what I have seen most recently, probably in the last few years, is that faculty are more amenable to being able to talk about skills um, and be able to understand the skills that they are teaching students within and how it relates to the world of work in some way. It doesn't it's not all faculty, certainly by by no means, but there's a much there's a much greater willingness than there ever has than I've ever seen. Um, and one of the things that I would love to see as just just a little small starting point is for um, is for our our faculty to put on their syllabus what are the five skills that students are learning that can translate.
translate to the world of work or to further education or whatever direction a student wants to go in. And that's a small thing because sometimes I think that faculty aren't speaking the same language as employers. And the more that we can get them speaking closer to each other um, and more alike, I think it, it and be more aligned, I think we're in much better shape. And I think that's a that's been a disconnect for a long time. And I think it's there are little small changes that you can make that can begin to get the conversation going with faculty and between employers as well. And have you been doing that? Um, um, on, on smaller scales, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, there are some faculty who, you know, we, we, in our College of Communication, m- many of them are really thinking about careers and how and, and what, what students are doing beyond their, uh, their, their classroom. And they're really open to talking about what skills their students are learning. We, you know, we're trying to integrate the NACE competencies into the conversation so that they understand how that translates to, um, to competencies and, and thinking about how to help students really to be able to translate what they're doing in a classroom and in their internships um, to the world of work. So you're really not, in any way, you're not asking the faculty to change what they're teaching, but rather to, to, um, to you know, shine that light of transparency on, on sort of the connections on, on, and being very explicit in some ways about what they're actually doing in the classroom. Yeah, and, and really trying to, to help faculty understand the importance of building career readiness into their curriculum, even if it's just small things like bringing alumni panels into, into their classroom to, so that students can learn about what, you know, what students, what, what people do when they leave your university um, with that major. I think small things can make a huge difference in, in beginning the conversation. Iris, I saw you nodding. Did were, were, did you want to jump in here too? I just wanted to say that the translation between uh, faculty and their the way they see competencies and sort of the outcomes of their courses, and then how that translates to employers is incredibly important. I'm I'm not going to name the vendor, but there is a vendor that. Um, uh, works to create and embed these work-based learning, like project-based learning pieces with faculty. And they actually work with the faculty to translate what the outcomes are of the project to the employer. And like, they play sort of that role. And I think whether or not you use an external vendor for that service, like playing that role as part of career services or working with your faculty and sort of career readiness is incredibly important. So it's backing up exactly what Gary said. Uh, Jack, I wonder if we could go back for a second to something that you you'd said um, a few minutes ago, which was um, about the sort of sort of managing employers' expectations too. I wonder, you know, when when you when you have employers who are thinking about like what they need right now, and and you're saying, well, we have students in the pipeline who aren't going to graduate for three or four years. I mean, how do you encourage them to think bigger, longer term? <laughs> well, what was interesting in some of these is, is that in some areas, and, and Mark, I, I don't know, you know, in the skills knowledge that George Mason was doing, but thinking about the Greater Washington Partnership, what was a really positive was they came out with what would be called the digital skills generalist. And frankly, this is a set of skills that all students should be able to have as they're entering the workforce, no matter what your major. And it was designed for really non-technical majors, but it covered a set of areas of some basic data analysis, basic cybersecurity, understanding um, how to be able to present and communicate data and some other aspects. And so there were some elements in there that, you know, we're starting to figure out how we can infuse across the curriculum Or if students aren't getting it in specific classes, we're working with our career services where they can take a non-credit practicum. But we've built out modules where they can go through and learn these skills so that they can be able to say, yes, no matter what my major, I've got these basic skills. That's, I think, a really great thing. In some of the areas where we've had highly detailed areas in machine learning where there's 80 skills, The reality is, is if a student had 40 of those skills, they still got five job offers right now. And so, you know, the the idea that you're going to want them to have all 80, um, it isn't changing the dynamic. If if students are are got 40, they're going to be hired by multiple employers and probably your own companies. And so they weren't able to actually be implementing because the job market is tight in many of these areas. Students who have the right skills are looking at two, three, four job offers right now. And so employers are having to settle a little bit. And so we've seen that they're understanding that 
they don't quite dictate, um, you know, exactly what they want to say. But I think it was really helpful in aligning a direction that they wanted us to be aiming. And so we've we really worked with them to try to show that we are in that direction. Um, Mark, I'm, I want to ask, have you weigh in on the same question? And but just sure. let me say in a second, and after you finish up, um, I'm going to bring in uh, my colleague Liz McMillan um, and. Uh, have our little um, interim Q and A, but Mark, did you want to say yeah, something about that? Just a few things. Um, first off, yeah, the the, the aspiration of uh, our our project was uh, was large, um, right? To be able to plot out all of the skills needed for that first year as a data science um, specialist or, or as a uh, cybersecurity specialist is challenging. But in those areas, there's a lot of commonality across industry about what was needed. And just winnowing out those critical factors that were most essential was very helpful, I think, for our students and for faculty. The question, though, is about the future, right? The next big job that's coming on, down the pike. And how do we begin to think about setting out those roadmaps for students to get through school to that new career that doesn't exist? The best example I can think of right now is around quantum computing. Mm -hmm. This is a field that's just emerging much less a discipline and an, and an area. So there are a number of us who are working on defining that field um, and working with employers to better understand what those potential future skills are gonna be. Uh, but that's way out there work um, and it doesn't happen very often. I think most of our students are just, what's that first job right out of my program that I'm gonna get? Not necessarily the full career. And in that area, I think uh, specifying those skills that are in demand in the market uh, is something we can do and has been proven successful. Um, I, I wanna come back and, and talk about some of those things, talk about what some successful models for university industry collaboration can look like and, and talk, um, you know, as, as a number of you have mentioned, sort of critically, you know, what does this look like particularly for, um, for students who come from backgrounds that may be, you know, not traditionally um, have, you know, been coming to college and how do you make sure that there's real equity in, in, in these roadmaps as well. But um, first, let me, turn this over to um, to Liz McMillan and, and to the audience. Um, please do keep um, putting your questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Karen, and thanks to the panel. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Todd Zipper uh, onto the screen. He's Executive Vice President of University Services and Talent Development at Biley. Welcome, Todd. I hope you're doing well today. Thanks. It's great to be here and really enjoying listening to the conversation today. So, you know, the panelists are talking broadly about preparing students for jobs of the future. From your perspective, how can universities work with the market better and, and not just for preparing uh, for a better job situation, but also, in essence, future proofing the university? Absolutely. And I think some of the uh, comments here, I, I might be repeating myself a little bit because uh, I think the, 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 the panelists are definitely on the right track as far as I'm concerned. Um, so let me just give some, some points from my end. It is, it, is, it is our belief that universities have to increasingly see employers as their customers, um, as much as they might see students as their customers, and that might even be debatable in uh -huh. certain places of the world. Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, you know, we take this idea at Wiley, we call it right to left education, uh -huh. where you start with the needs of the labor market. Uh, whether that's the employers, the jobs that are available, the skills that are needed. And you sort of work backwards from there in terms of building the education programs, the pathways that are needed to really fill those gaps. And I think if you do that well, institutions will graduate more students and provide a stronger return on investment, really for all the stakeholders involved. Once they start to make that mindset shift, um, I, I think you're going to see um, a, a lot of changes happening in the university, you know, whether that's around uh, the programs that they offer, uh, whether that's the features, whether it's how they serve students. So I think those are the kinds of things that you're gonna see. And some recommendations I have, just really thinking about the program, because ultimately that's what students go to universities for. I, I have some strategies, if you will, that we've seen by working with our 70 plus partners uh, throughout the US and, and globally um, that we seem to think are working. You know, first off is, you know, really try to embed career services more into the program itself. I heard one of the panelists 
sort of talk about this. I've seen, I've met a couple companies where actually working with one of them where they're doing these kind of micro internships, if you will, or working on real world problems, um, which, you know, has a whole bunch of implications around their education itself, but also connecting already to employers within the process. Um, I would bring employers into the conversations, you know, whether that's forming advisory boards around uh, particular programs. So you're constantly getting that sort of real-time feedback on what actually skills are needed, uh, what our job-ready graduates need to look like. So that's something else I would look at. I would also really study um, salaries around the kind of the downstream after these students, um, you know, graduate and making sure that there's not a disconnect between the cost of a program and really what they're ultimately making. Um, and then finally, I would relentlessly um, look at outcomes. I think it's a challenge for, for everyone to really understand, you know, where are my graduates in one year, in three years, in five years? There's some data out there, but I think it needs to get a lot more robust. It needs a whole sort of ecosystem solution, working with the Department of Education, uh, working with surveying companies, whatever you can do to really get that. And that I think will help course correct um, and, and allow universities to be even more career connected, um, as I like to say. Right. I, you know, I think it's interesting that there are some questions in uh, the Q&A box just about uh, faculty uh, response to some of these kind of changes. How, how has that played out at, at some of the institutions you just mentioned? Have, have there been particular ways to um, bring faculty along? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the panelists said, said this as well or hinted this. I, I mean, I don't think that there's necessarily a ton of resistance from faculty. Uh, from what our experience is, I think it's more of just the inertia of the system. Programs have just existed in a certain way. And to make a whole bunch of changes takes a lot of committees, a lot of work. And it doesn't mean that there's not, and people have jobs. <laughs> so to really go and change things often is extra work. Um, and so I think it's just kind of breaking, trying to break the inertia ultimately of the institution, which is hard. Yeah, absolutely. I want to switch to uh, the broad topic of educational benefits uh, at companies and you know, a number of places have been adding them, uh, rethinking them, expanding them. How do you think that they could be more strategic uh, about those benefits? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, I think the, the number is somewhere around $20 billion a year in the U.S. Um, is given out in tuition uh, reimbursement. You know, there's this tax benefit of, I think it's $5,250. A lot of companies have this as a benefit. And it's, but from my experience in doing this over a decade, it hasn't really been an, uh, a strategic benefit, a benefit that, or, that is, is how they're going to actually, you know, increase the talent in their business. They're going to retrain their talent. They're going to increase their reputation. But I think that a lot of factors have sort of just come together, um, especially over the last few years, that I think companies are sort of uh, changing that mindset. You know, as we are in this great resignation right now that we're experiencing, and we have a desperate need to recruit talent, um, as we are in this pretty disconnected job skills gap that we have, panelists talked about, you have certain people getting four offers, others maybe not so much, mm -hmm. um, and tons of jo uh, job openings that are, are absolutely available that I think employers, rightfully so, are trying to take matters into their own hands. And that's maybe a little bit extreme and what I'm saying here, but let's look at Amazon as a great example of that. They uh, recently announced um, the uh, kind of the evolution of their career choice program. Full disclosure, we have um, we're part of their Canada program around software development. We have our M3 talent development business as part of that. But they chose, I think it was something like 140 uh, educational providers. You know, from uh, sort of the, the the sort of the mega nonprofits like Western Governors down to community colleges. But they took an extremely intentional approach to the types of programs that would lead to the types of outcomes that they wanted to see uh, for their individuals, whether it was inside of their company working for Amazon or maybe leaving and getting a livable wage job somewhere else. So I think, you know, um, Amazon's sort of leading from the front there. There's a lot of companies doing stuff, but I think you're going to see more companies not just having as a benefit. And having called 3% adoption, 4% adoption around specifically the tuition benefit, but actually broadening the benefit to include way more than just, uh, you know, sort of degree granting uh, benefits. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I'm seeing that evolve. 
Right. Um, and, and before I uh, pass things back to Karen, I, I did want to pick up on something that Mark was just talking about at the at the very uh, end there about sort of the roadmap of future skills um, and how hard that is to, to really plot that out. How should universities be thinking about that and, and trying to look down and, and figure something out that's very difficult? Yeah, I, I agree. I think you can definitely get into some analysis paralysis here. And going back to my initial um, right to left education approach, I think when you start with the job and the employer and you don't just project some sort of big statistic that you hear, like for example, cybersecurity, right? Mm -hmm. We think, I think the latest data point is one out of every five tech jobs are in, uh, are in cybersecurity right now or new jobs that are offered. But you have to kind of unpack that onion to say, well, are those junior talent? Because that's kind of what colleges are focused on is mostly graduating you know, people at the start of their career. Certainly we have master's programs and post-grad stuff. And so to me, it's really getting into the employers, getting into the jobs and working backwards um, and, and solving for that. And I'll give an example of something that we're doing, sort of partnering on one side of the fence with employers, the other side with universities. This model is called Hire, Train, Deploy. Um, and I discovered it um, really being hired by a staffing company to, um, to do kind of the, the last mile bootcamp training around uh, full stack development. And what we realized, which was exciting about this model was they started with the employer, they started with the job, then they worked backwards and they, and they kind of put this six to 12 week program in place that really got them job ready. It, it taught students um, of specific technology stacks of that particular uh, investment bank that we were working with at the time. And, and so it really cut down to what is actually needed right now to get them to add value day one. And so that's what my focus would be is continue to keep partnering with the employer, especially in the communities that universities work with, and not just looking at the theoretical data and building towards that, because that actually might not get people jobs. Right. Well, thank you very much, Todd, and thank you to Wiley for making this conversation uh, possible. I'm going to hand things back to Karen and, and the panel. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. And I just invite my panelists to come back on screen. Um, let me pick up where actually that conversation left off and ask. I noticed a lot in the, the chat about this. And let me thank everybody. Um, there's a lot of great observations, also some great resources in the Q&A. So I encourage you all to, to take a look at it. But I want to ask um, the panel a little bit about sort of the model for industry partnerships. Somebody observed, you know, for example, these sort of university industry, you know, industry advisory boards, for example, of they're, they're not a new thing. And, and um, I wonder if there are ways that you have each found um, to, to sort of build a, a sustainable, maybe more institutionalized relationship with industry partners so that you are hearing, you know, consistent feedback and, and having a, a consistent conversation um, with them. And maybe Gary, I can start with you and ask you a little bit about what, what that kind of looks like for you. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. So we, at, at Butler, we've sort of taken an individual approach because um, there, there's there is some employers are interested in certain types of activities, others, other things work for them. So um, we, we take a kind of an individual unique approach to them and kind of listen to the employers um, and what they're interested in. What we do know is that most of our employers that we work with are interested in building deeper relationships. They want more than just coming to a career fair. They want to get more more involved with the institution, uh, more than just posting a job. And so we, we, we have, at Butler, we're lucky to have um, a team of people who are out there doing that right now. They're out there talking to employers um, on the university's behalf, not just on career services behalf, about building deeper partnerships. So let me give you an example of one of the partnerships that we have here at Butler is um, we, we had a, a local employer who I was meeting with um, one day who talked about, you know, we need students who have Salesforce. We need students who have some background in Salesforce. And it took a, a little while. It took six months to a year. But we built an opportunity for them to um, offer sort of a certificate or a badge in, in Salesforce. Um, it's a 12-week program. Students don't get any credit for it, but they get to take um, 
and the, the company will actually pay for their Salesforce exam. So that's a unique opportunity that we're looking to take that model and maybe duplicate it because so many employers will, will want, you know, get, we like to get them to teach our students skills rather than just let them do an information session. So it's getting them to really be active with our students. And that Salesforce partnership um, has been really good. We had about 17 students sign up this past semester. So um, really good opportunity for an employer and a group of students to talk um, to each other in hopes that a talent pipeline develops. To have the, the employers also be a resource themselves and Absolutely. provide some of that educational opportunity. Yep. And it's alumni that are teaching it. So hmm. that is even a better approach um, you know, to have that. Uh, Mark, Jack, I, I wanted to ask you if you had any sort of other institutional observations um, for what, what has worked at, at your, your colleges. Sure. Um, I think uh, Todd sort of hit it. Uh, it's that relationship building that's so important. And actually, Gary, you made, made the same point. You have to really understand where the employer is uh, and build and foster that relationship. So we've had a couple of one-on-one -on -one type of relationships at George Mason that were really very powerful. Amazon happened to be one of those uh, where they spell out what they're looking for. And there's a dialogue that emerges. And for us, it was the creation of a cloud computing uh, degree uh, as a result of that conversation. So a whole degree in partnership with a community college, uh, Northern Virginia Community College and George Mason and Amazon. So that partnership was a, a unique launching point for a dialogue that's continued into other areas, including security, uh, data analytics and other, other fields that are related to it. Uh, so that's one sort of narrow one-on-one -on -one sort of relationship. The area that we haven't done, and I think I'd be interested in the others of you on this, uh, as well as these relationships that Guild Education is forming with um, uh, large universities or uh, in stride, where you're basically working from the inside of an employer's um, HR uh, uh, function to better understand what the learning needs are of that uh, employee base and working with universities to help uh, develop those skills and develop those degrees actually uh, within the workforce. So to me, that's the next uh, area for us to all explore in our own in our own ways, and those are two really powerful ways to build relationships: the one-on-one, -on -one and then the the uh, the working with uh, with a company on the inside, uh, and and really understanding their HR needs. You know, if I if I could add just sort of two things, I I think one, we do a lot of work with our career services to be able to be collecting data on who's getting hired. Um, all of this data is part of the academic program review. We're feeding it in. Departments have to be looking at you know, hiring information to be making sure programs are have effectiveness. But where we're starting to take it, which I think will be really helpful, is doing much more work where we're mining LinkedIn data and trying to be getting LinkedIn profiles early on as part of the career services activity. So now we can be following those alumni and where they're ending up. One, it allows us to be doing what, you know, was sort of highlighted by Gary of how do we bring the right alumni back to be thinking about skills building or opportunities. But it's also, I think, beginning to think about how broadly our students are ending up in different career slots than we might have ever imagined. And, and that's happening at every university is, is that students are ending up in a broader array of things. And I think that's a good story because what it says is, is we're teaching the skills for students to be able to go on, learn, adapt, and develop in ways that we hadn't anticipated. That's, that's an interesting. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a couple of things to this that actually I think reinforce a lot of what's already been said. But um, one thing we've seen that works really well and tends to indicate a really strong relationship with employers is being able to strategically um, uh, allocate and recruit adjuncts who actually work for the employers where your um, where your students end up or where they might want to end up working. So that helps um, integrate the curriculum, update the curriculum, keep those skills really um, sharp without having to go through maybe a really formal process of continuing to do that. So this is like beyond the advisory committee, right? The other thing we've seen, and Gary um, alluded to this too, is um, making sure that you're aligning to industry recognized certifications. 
Um, this is obviously particularly true in the tech sector uh, where they have very well-developed um, certification structures. It's less true in some other occupationally focused um, work, but that's another way where you can sort of take what the, what the employers have decided are the skills they need and make sure that you're embedding those types of skills into the curriculum that you're teaching. Um, so those are a, a couple of ways we've seen that um, colleges have helped um, keep their curriculum current and have demonstrated really good um, relationships with their employer partners. You know, somebody noted was noting in the Q and A that one of the challenges is obviously the curriculum is is kind of a slow, a slow beast to change. That going through the process of of of, of changing, you know, a, a curriculum within a major might take a year. Um, I wonder um, if there are ways in which um, you think colleges can be more nimble that they can be innovative and, and look to different kinds of, of mechanisms to, to make sure that they are, for example, as you said, Iris, uh, aligning with the particular, you know, licensure demands, for example, of a particular um, employer. We, we all have accrediting bodies that we ultimately need to build our curriculum in alignment with in many respects. And, uh, and those standards can change over time. Um, but the, the nimbleness, I think, Mary was talking about it earlier, and Iris as well, the micro-credential, which is a non-credit form of skill building and, and uh, acknowledgement of what a university can help us learn and acquire in a university context that has relevance outside the university and uh, in the job market. So certainly micro-credentialing and digital badges and industry-based certification uh, is an area that can supplement a degree. Uh, and I think it's really important to think of it as a supplement, that a degree is helping you get a, a career, not just a, a job. Uh, and these micro-credentials are really helpful at specifying the skills that you've got to be able to bring to a job. Gary. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. I think that is going to become ever more popular from universities is the idea of that micro-credentialing or stackable credentials, whatever you call it. Um, I think it will become even more prevalent um, because the, there are so many unique skills that students are looking to build and giving them opportunities to do that sort of degree plus type of activity where they take, you know, a coding class um, when they're in communications or they take something that will really make them a more attractive candidate. Candidate, um, I think is really a, a, a great thing that's going to happen. We, we're looking right now at partnering with um, one of those, um, I won't say which one, but one of those um, one of those companies that does that because I think it is really important for students to be able to have those opportunities to add to their portfolio of skills just beyond what they're learning in their academic um, in their academic curriculum. Jack, you'd mentioned too that it's not just about what they're learning in the classroom period, but it's also this sort of broader uh, range of experiences that can really um, help students develop the skills. I mean, what, uh, what are some other high kind of impact practices that colleges need to be, you know, encouraging, need to be focused on that can ensure that, that students are, are getting skills, not just, you know, what's happening, you know, in, in the, the classroom? So, you know, one of the, the groups that we're partnering very heavily with is our student affairs. Um, student affairs does incredible work in leadership development, um, in service learning, um, in teamwork, other kinds of activities to build out for student groups, for student leaders, for others, and being able to document through micro-credentials, but have the evidence that is linked in as to what it actually means that's where we're trying to be thinking about bringing some of this co-curricular elements in because for a lot of students, it's a critically important component of their educational experience, what they've been doing outside the classroom as well. And so I think thinking through how we can be representing this in ways, it's, it's not talking about necessarily putting it on the transcript, but it's showing what they've been doing and it helps them be able to talk about these experiences and tie it in to the broader mix of things that they've also done in the academic setting. So to me, that's one of the areas that I'm really passionate about because I think service learning, experiential learning, these all fuse to make a difference in bringing you know, students to be able to show what they're able to do. Marcus, are you nodding? Oh, it's, you know, I was just thinking as Jack was 
speaking earlier about the comprehensive learner record, uh, transcripts, employers use them to validate that someone went to university, but they rarely open them up and take a look at what someone did, right? And, and when a student is going in front of an interview, uh, they're rarely looking at their transcript to remind them of what they, they're looking at their resume, they're looking at LinkedIn. That's the, the place where skills need to reside and, and be reflected. Uh, so there's new tools that we're all thinking about, um, digital badging, comprehensive learner records, and boy, the, and you're right, Jack, the, the experiences that someone has in, let's say, a global context um, can be reflected in, in these skill um, identifiers, um, not just micro-credentials, but the skill itself. And exactly. It's more digital world that we're entering into. If, if I could have one last thing on this, though, where and where I think it's important for universities to begin experimenting and thinking about this is that one of the groups that I, I work with nationally, um, we're doing a lot of work with industry about how to be thinking about what the standards need to be for their workforce hiring systems to be able to automatically consume micro-credentials. And I can tell you that in the next two or three years, almost all the major workforce systems are gonna be able to be consuming micro-credentials um, directly as part of um, what their intake is going to be. So instead of doing the text processing where they're looking for keywords, they're gonna be looking for different kinds of micro-credentials. And this is gonna make this much more important to be exposing your learning outcomes, your skills, your competencies um, through the educational process. Iris, is that the answer? Is micro credentials the the way that we're going to have you know overcome that translation problem that you got us started with, or are there other ways that that are going to have to sort of be put in place? Um, so I would just say that um, micro credentials are only as good as how well they're recognized by uh, mm -hmm. industry, and so that's why I go to industry recognized certifications because those are already recognized by industry, although they have lots of problems with them. At least they've been validated and they generally tend to show up in job postings and things like that. So I think the challenge with micro-credentials is that um, translation challenge and um, Jack alluded to the fact that they are working on this, um, particularly through their HR systems, that's wonderful. Um, but it's something that I think we need to continue to follow and uh, following up on LinkedIn and places like that and making sure that those actually are recognized by your industry partners and that there is value associated with them. Because if you are encouraging students to partake in these experiences, particularly if they're non-credit, particularly if they're still charging tuition, I would say you really need to validate that they are being recognized and have value in the marketplace. Um, and that's not always true, So, but sometimes it is. So it's really important to continue to follow it. Um, it is one solution. Uh, I think it, we need to work on both sides of the equation, both in the education side and on the employer side to be able to make this translation um, and continue to, to work on it. Um, I wanna shift to gears for, for the last few minutes we have and talk a little bit about students themselves. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that clearly who, who are in our classrooms today um, is shifting. We have a lot more first generation, um, non-traditionally aged students, you know, a lot of students who come from um, backgrounds that, that bring with them some headwinds. And, and unfortunately, you know, just as it can be challenging for those students to, you know, to enroll in college, to be retained and to complete, it, they also um, often face special hurdles in in you know making this transition to career and somebody had asked this in the the the, the q a but are there ways that we should be thinking about how to to also make sure that we are serving the students that we have today that we are refining our um the these sort of processes to help um especially with students who may be from disadvantaged backgrounds Maybe Iris, I can start. I'm happy. We, 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 we have to do a better job of this. And it was interesting. I was yesterday, I was talking to a young man and, you know, first generation um, person of color, you know, wanting to get into the tech field and he's transferring from community college. And so we're talking about, you know, different ways. We have to get students linked as early as possible into career services. You know, often, uh, um, especially students that are first gen or students of color, 
they may not have all of the family connections that are helping them have asked questions of parents, loved ones, others. And so you need to be able to be getting them to expert advice that can help them be able to make the decisions that they need to make. Because if you wait until you're ready to graduate, you've missed out on so much opportunity between when you started at a university and when you graduate, it's getting them there as early as possible to begin thinking about these kinds of efforts. Um, and I'll lastly end by saying, you know, one of the things that he and I talked about is I could tell he's really interested in how he can create his own business at some point. And so linking him to think about many universities have entrepreneurship and other things. What's great about these entrepreneurship, you know, methods is, is that begin to get students thinking about how they're doing their own personal branding. And I think that that's a key element in the workforce of the future. You know, if, if it's right that the future, you know, students that are in school today will have 20 or 30 or 40 different jobs over their career, we've got to be thinking about how they're building their personal branding. And so that to me is another element that we have to begin thinking about and starting, especially with non-traditional students. Iris, let me turn to you so, and then Gary. Yeah, after. thank you. Uh, first, I just want to say we see in, un, unequal access across um, higher education. That is particularly true, though, for work-based learning opportunities and for students who do not see themselves in those opportunities, do not pursue those opportunities, and are not recruited into those opportunities. Um, we're doing a project right now where it's just very obvious that, the, um, that people in the um, groups you're talking about um, black, brown students do not see themselves, low income students, first generation students do not see themselves in those opportunities and thus do not take advantage of them. And that really puts them at a disadvantage in the labor market. It also means we need to stop unpaid internships. That's just one piece, but like it's very important as far as an equity piece is concerned. I would also add um, gender to this list. It's actually a huge problem across the um, our, our labor market. There's not much higher education can necessarily do to this. This is structural in a lot of ways. Um, we need to improve pay, particularly in care occupations that really employ many women of color in particular. Um, but colleges, I think, need to make their own goals um, for improving these outcomes. So thinking about and tracking the labor market outcomes of their students and thinking about how they can um, have goals to improve and create more equity in the um, outcomes they're seeing for their students. And then really working with their employer partners to think about structural changes in the labor market. Um, with their employer partners. You do have leverage at this point. They do need your students. So bringing them to the table and really having hard conversations about some of the disparities you're seeing, even though you're not knowing necessarily the exact disparities, but just like acknowledging there are disparities and having those hard conversations, I think is really important. Yeah, somehow we we, we sometimes think, oh, the disparities are going to end as soon as we get the students in the classroom and, and they just are deep and persistent. Um, Gary. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what Jack and Iris both said was was fantastic. Um, it is, in 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 my mind, about in, you know engaging these students very early in um, in career conversations and career development. Um, the one thing that I would add to what Jack and Iris said um, is the idea of mentorship. Um, is talking to those that have come before you, I think is critically important. I don't believe that a lot of mentor relationships and a lot of mentor programs that are, are out there are the best to get those conversations going. I think they naturally occur more than they do when they're forced. Um, but, you know, there's always alumni that are out there, um, you know, in, in cases of black and brown students, there's alumni that are out there that really want to work with um, students who were like them when they came in to, to Butler. Um, and I think they're, you know, getting them interacting as much as possible, I think is really critical from a very early stage. Um, so we're going to wrap up here in a second. I want to give each of you maybe about 30 seconds just to, to give it a parting final thought. Is there one particular idea or theme maybe that we've talked about or that, I mean, I know I have about 30 more questions here for you that I didn't get to, but that you would maybe we haven't talked about that you would like to, to leave the, the group with. Mark, why don't I start with you? Sure. Uh, no, this has been a great discussion. And I think we hit on so many important topics. This last one is the most essential in my mind, which is creating uh, a greater sense of equity and equality in the country. And I think, you know, universities have a lot to, to contribute and, and employers are seeking a more diverse workforce. So our ability to make skills more transparent uh, is part of higher education. 
and associate that to experiential work um, like apprenticeships uh, for diverse communities, I think is a, a really important next step for all of us. Um, Iris. I would just say um, connecting to your um, economic development agencies, connecting to some of the federally funded um, uh, research centers and thinking about that future of work and the future of skills and what's coming down the pike and how to connect that to your current um, uh, degrees is, is really important and not something we talked too much about today. And Jack? No, I, I just echo what has been said. <laughs> and Gary, I'll give you the final word. Um, I, I would just say the art of being nimble is critical right now because there's no rules for a lot of this and we're all writing it at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems like an understatement. Um, well, thank you to my terrific panel um, and thank you to all of us um, for joining us today. Thanks also to, to Wiley Education Services for underwriting um, this panel. We really appreciate their support. Uh, just a reminder, today's session was recorded and we will be sending an email within a couple of days um, to everyone who registered. So if some of your colleagues were not able to make it, um, if they registered, they will be able to, to get um, some of this sort of wisdom and insight from our panel today. So um, thanks to everyone for joining us and for the Chronicle, I'm Karen Fisher. Have a good day. <laughs>